Uh, Van Gogh is uh, probably one of the most misunderstood uh, characters in art history. <laughs> there's a lot of them, and uh, he's one of the most under misunderstood ones. And there's things we know about Van Gogh, and there's some things we don't know about Van Gogh. So what we're going to talk about today, a little bit about the history of uh, who he was, and why that's going to affect his art, and what is so uh, important about his art, and, and important about Vincent Van Gogh. So we're going to go through here. This is a photograph of him. This is one of his self-portraits that he did. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I remember the self-portrait uh, back in, in when I was in, in fifth grade in the late 1960s. Uh, I, I went to the L.A. County Museum and I saw this portrait of Vincent Van Gogh along with this portrait of potato eaters. And as a, as a fifth grader, I remember this being the first time I was really interested in art. And it had a lot to do with uh, me getting started and being inspired uh, uh, to be an artist throughout you know, high school and college and, and my career, my, basically my entire life. So when I, when I, when I see this portrait and I, and I see this painting, uh, personally, it means a lot to me. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about Vincent Van Gogh. Now, Vincent Van Gogh was... A, I'm, just, I'm just scratching the surface. I'm going to try to do about four or five hours of, of information in about 20 minutes. So basically, Vincent Van Gogh was a, a son <coughs> of a minister, and, uh, and Vincent basically wanted to become a minister himself. Uh, but he had a hard time with the academics of it. He goes to school to learn the information that he needs to know. And uh, Vincent's brain is very divergent. He's thinking about a lot of things and, and probably has a hard time just focusing on academics. But he wasn't able to pass the test that he needed to pass uh, to become a minister. So what he does instead, he becomes a, a missionary. And, and uh, Vincent, he's Dutch, and he is sent to the Netherlands, in his hometown, in, in his own country, uh, to some small mining uh, towns in the Netherlands. And he is sent to these towns, uh, this town, and he's going to be a missionary. He doesn't have much money, but the people there are even more poor than he is. So he sees children now nutrition, children uh, starving, and people without. And he had a very difficult time having the little bit of money he had. He had money, and he had means. He had food. He had shelter, and he really had a hard time. Uh, you know, you know. Because he wanted to be a minister, he's trying to be a Christian, he's trying to be a good guy, you know. So uh, he gives his, his food away uh, to the point that uh, he becomes, becomes malnutritioned himself and, and becomes sick. And, and, and generally what the church does, it takes him back, brings him back, and says, okay, we're going to send you out again. Uh, but if this happens again, if you get sick and you have these problems, we're just simply going to have to take you out of the ministry. So they send him back, and the same thing basically happens again. He becomes sick. He gives everything he can. He just can't stand to see other people around him poorer than him and to see children starving and so forth and so on. So he, he, he gave his substance and he was kicked out of the ministry. But before he, uh, he leaves, he starts painting. And this is a painting here of a family. This is called the, the Potato Eaters. Now the Potato Eaters is, is basically general. Uh, the people in this coal mining town, they literally would would go to work. They'd work seven days a week. They'd go into the mines, or the coal mines, which were very dangerous, and you had you got black lung, uh, it, it made you sick. It was just a nasty, horrible, dirty job. And only the very poor would do it uh, to get money. So they would go to work before sunrise. They'd work, you know, 16, 17, 18 hours sometimes, come back, uh, come out of the mines when it's dark. And uh, I heard, uh, read some journals uh, one time where, where people in these mines actually may go uh, two, three months without seeing the light of day. Uh, very difficult, very poor situation. And what we have here is we have the people sitting at a table, this family at the table, and the only thing they can afford to eat are uh, potatoes. So they have their water or tea, uh, and they would cut the potatoes up into pieces, maybe put a little salt or something on it, and a little pepper or whatever, and they would eat that. And, and basically that was the main part of their diet, and these are the potato eaters. And it just shows you uh, just, just how poor, this very, very low, poor working class is. So Vincent, uh, he, he's attracted to the poor uh, and the innocent sometimes, and he does, uh, he does uh, drawings, he does charcoal drawings, uh, he does... Uh, 
uh, sketches. He does pen and inks. Uh, he does oil paints. So uh, here, generally, he often has uh, general working class people just doing their job, trying to make ends meet. Uh, he did beautiful pen and inks uh, of landscape of individuals. Uh, this right here, this piece right here, we have uh, one of his letters to his brother Theo. Uh, now, now Theo, uh, now we got Vincent and Theo, our two brothers in a family of this this family who's a minister. Uh, Theo works for art galleries, and he'll have an art gallery. <coughs> And he's going to basically support Vincent by sending him the little bit of money he has. He sends it to Vincent in the southern France. Uh, Vincent, as a painter, goes to the southern France generally. Uh, he was in Paris and a few other places, but, but generally goes to southern France. And Theo's in Paris. And so Theo uh, gives him a little bit of money. And Vincent will write a letter almost every day to his brother Theo. Sometimes two, and sometimes actually three times a day. He would write a letter, fold it up, put an envelope, put a stamp on it, give it to the postman, and have it go to, uh, to Theo. They were very, very close. Uh, had a very close relationship. <coughs> so uh, this is a letter uh, that he writes. Now, if you were, were to take... Uh, uh, Theo, Theo sep saved all his letters, and uh, they're actually a volume of books. I think it's like ten books uh, on a bookshelf, a volume of all the letters that, uh, that Vincent uh, sent Theo and some of the letters that Theo sent back to Vincent. And this letter right here is talking about a painting, apparently, that he's working on, and this is the painting right here. Uh, uh, Vincent, later his physical and mental health doctor, was Dr. Gachet, uh, and he became close friends with Dr. Gachet, and this here is a, uh, a painting of Dr. Gachet's daughter. Uh, she's going to keep this painting with her her whole life for 40-some years, and, and it's still hung in her house when she died. Now, Vincent, in his letters, he explains that when he does a painting of somebody, that painting represents his love for that person. And when he does a painting of nature, or a drawing of nature, it is an exemplar of his love for nature, or his love toward God. So Vincent, who is a, a loving person, who believes in God, and he's an artist, so his artwork represents his love for people, nature, or God. It's something very natural uh, that's going to happen with him. And this is going to be very important later on in his life. So Vincent... Uh, also, like I say, he'll do pen and inks often before he does does a painting. Now, some interesting things about his work and the technique that he's doing. You remember the Impressionist with Claude Monet? Claude Monet is also painting at the same time. The Impressionists are. These periods kind of overlap a little bit. <clears throat> Vincent is actually the uh, the movement between Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. Post-Impressionism is going to the leader is going to be Paul Gauguin, and Paul Gauguin is going to be known for painting uh, uh, completely losing depth of field in his work by using hard outlines and solid colors. And what Vincent's going to do, he's going to take the very three-dimensional uh, value uh, used in the paints in Impressionism, very three-dimensional looking things, and then Vincent's going to start making longer brush strokes. These long brush strokes probably wouldn't have never been done in an Impressionist painting. And what he's doing is, he takes this tree right here, and he does this black outline, which has a tendency of flattening out that figure and not making it look three-dimensional. Look how flat that figure is. How flat that is compared to these that don't have the black line on the outside, and how three-dimensional that looks, and then how flat these look. So he starts making longer brush strokes and starts to uh, outline some of the, uh, the objects in his work with these long lines. Uh, matter of fact, Vincent said he's glad he didn't graduate from art school. He went a little bit but couldn't hang in there. But he says the art teachers would have taught him that it was incorrect and he would get 
paint uh, tubes of paint and apply the paint directly to the canvas from the tube of paint. And he said that he would have been taught not to do that. So he's glad he didn't go to school much uh, to be taught not to do certain things. And you can see right here with this piece, you have longer lines on the ground. There's all kinds of long lines right here around the sun, all kinds of these long lines. Again, he's transitioning between an Impressionist and a Post-Impressionist by elongating these lines and, uh, and outlining with hardline colors right here. This is a famous painting of his bedroom. And here we have <coughs> the asylum. See, Vincent was, was having some problems. As, as he was painting, uh, well, the problem with paints back in the day was they would, would have a lot of lead in them. And when Vincent would be painting, if the paint was a little too dry, he'd put the paintbrush up to his tongue, and he would lick it and put a little spit on it and continue to paint. And then he'd do it again and again and again. And by the time he got done with the painting after a couple hours, he would have this, this paint just, just, just dripping, flowing off his chin, onto his, onto his neck and his chest. He'd have all this paint on him. And, but he was licking it all day, <coughs> which would uh, contribute to a high level of, of lead poisoning. And we know lead poisoning can cause some serious problems. And then on top of that, he would take a cup. He was very poor, but he would take a glass or a cup or a can, a tin can or whatever, and he would put the lacquer thinner uh, to clean the brushes in that. So as he would paint with his brush, he would clean his brush on the lacquer thinner, then get some more paint, 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 clean the brush on the lacquer thinner, and do that all day. And the bottom would be kind of the sludge of this, of this, of this residue of the oil paint, and just a lot of lead, just a lot of lead in that. And because he couldn't afford uh, a bottle of wine or a glass of wine at the end of the day, uh, he would take uh, this, this lacquer thinner uh, with all this paint cleaned in there and, all, and a massive amount of lead in there, and then he would drink that. And it would kind of give him a buzz a little bit, I'm sure it would. And, and that would attribute to some pretty heavy uh, lead poisoning. Now, lead poison and other things, but this is an example of something that may have caused some of his instability. He dealt with depression, <coughs> and, then, and then one time when, when Paul Gauguin, uh, and this is a, a picture of Paul Gauguin. Uh, Paul Gauguin came to southern France, and Paul Gauguin was a banker, and he didn't have a lot of art education, but he came to southern France, and he began to know Van Gogh, and they started working together. And one time, they both had very strong personalities, and they, and they fought violently one night, and Gauguin leaves, and this really gets uh, uh, Van Gogh very, very upset, and it kicked off like a grand mal seizure, and he was having a seizure, and during that seizure, he, uh, where he lose, and some of you may be familiar with what seizures do, but basically you lose your, your physical and mental ability, basically to control yourself at that point, and and he, during that time, he mangled his ear, or cut his ear off, and there's all kinds of stories about what he did with it, but it was done during a, what he calls a fit of madness. It was basically seizures. He didn't understand what was going on with them, so he'd go to Dr. Gachet, and he'd say, hey, I get these fits of madness, and Dr. Gachet says, when that happens, just come to the asylum and check yourself in. We'll take care of you for a while. So, that's what happened. So, in this painting right here of the asylum, right over here are some flowers, and these are the flowers right here, uh, the irises. And the full iris painting is right here. <clears throat> now, personally, I have a stained glass window of this painting that a student did for me. It has 650 pieces of glass, and it's 40 inches by 40 inches. It's a beautiful stained glass that I have in uh, my home. I, I grow and raise irises of this color and large white ones. And during the summertime in my yard, this is what my yard looks like. Uh, I have a... a, a, a uh, great love for the irises and uh, daylilies in which Van Gogh painted. Here's a, a detail of the irises where you have the long lines. Again, Impressionists would have never done that. The long outlines, it begins to flatten things out with the depth of field. Uh, this is a, uh, a painting of Dr. Gachet. Again, you see the long lines. <coughs> now, Dr. Gachet... Uh, is the one who took care of him. Now, there's there's a lot of speculation about Dr. Che and in, in, in the relationship that he had with Vincent Van Gogh, uh, and I'll get into that in a moment. Okay, we uh, see some of the uh, uh, some of the pen and inks. 
And here you see some of the nature pieces. See the long lines. Look how long these lines are getting in there. Again, the long lines, outlines of the figures. Uh, Vince Van Gogh uh, did work from about age uh, 28 to about age 37 when he passed away. So he only had about nine years, some say eight years, uh, of, of painting. And it really is the last two or three years that he did most of his paintings and did uh, over 800 paintings and, and thousands of drawings. And uh, so he did a massive amount of work. Matter of fact, uh, when he, he started having seizures, uh, sometimes when people have seizures, people that I know that have seizures, they would have their seizure, they'd lose you know, physical control of their body and their mind. Uh, usually they would lay on the ground and they would kind of come to. You come to and may go to bed or, they, or, they, or they'll be okay. But then what happens is they'll have a, a, a block of memory that they, they don't remember what happened during that time. Now sometimes that could be an hour or two and sometimes that they forget or it could be a whole day, or two days, or three days, or four days. It would be a long period of time. And often, Van Gogh would have a seizure, uh, wake up from a seizure, and he may put himself into the asylum. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. But, uh, but sometimes he'd wake up one day and have a complete block, uh, no memory of the last two, three, four days. And it was really bizarre, because then he would wake up, but during those three or four days, he was still active, and he would paint, and there might be three or four or five, six, seven paintings hanging in his home that he doesn't even remember painting, which is really kind of interesting. So <coughs> here we have now another piece here that I like. Now this is interesting right here. Vincent Van Gogh, when he was in a normal state, he painted his normal work. But there were times when Vincent was in a psychotic state, psychotic state, when he was recovering from a seizure, uh, like this one, Starry Night, this is when he painted in the asylum just after he had a seizure and he mangled his ear. So he was in an incredible, intense uh, stress situation here. So this would have been a piece that he did when he wasn't stressed out in a seizure, and this is when he would have been just after a seizure. And, he, and we don't know exactly if he actually remembers painting this very much, but, uh, but what's happening here is some very, very, very intellectual, very high mathematical things are happening with this one. And what I, what I want you to do is I want you to read, there's a, uh, I want you to watch, there's a YouTube video that goes along with this lecture that's in the cl Google Classroom. I want you to, when you get done, I want you to watch that video. Uh, and it talks about this piece where we have Van Gogh doing regular work, and there's geniuses out there, and then there's the top genius, the Einstein-type people out there. But then when Van Gogh did this in a stressed state of mind, he actually does some mathematical things that are beyond, you know, the Einsteins and people like that. There's some actually incredible things that are happening here, and they happen when he's in a fit of madness, in a state of seizure in his life, and does some absolutely incredible things. Basically, the brain is doing visual things that are off the charts intellectually. And I really want you to watch that video. Uh, Van Gogh was a good religious person early in his life, and this is the pain of the Good Samaritan. Uh, this is the painting. We've talked about Michelangelo and the Pieta. A Pieta is the dead Christ and, a, and the mother Mary. And this is what this is. I kind of find it kind of interesting that the, that the Christ has a very close resemblance of, of, of Van Gogh. Uh, this piece right here is the last painting that he did. This is the wheat filled with, with the crows. And, uh, and, and, and what happened was when, when Vincent... Uh, uh, this is the last piece he did, and, and what happened was, there's conflicting stories, and, and, I've, and I've read a lot and saw, I've seen movies, I've seen all kinds of things about Vincent <coughs> in his last days, but what basically happened is, uh, from what I understand, is what uh, Vincent had uh, sent some work to his brother Theo, who had an art gallery, and Theo would stretch them, and he would, uh, he would show them. And then a minor art critic came along, and he said, boy, Vincent, his work is really, really, really good. He's going to be the next big artist here in Paris. So Theo sends that article to Van Vincent, and Vincent gets it. And Vincent, instead of being happy about it, Vincent goes, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, 
I mean, remember, Vincent is showing his love for nature with this piece, his love for God, his love for other people. And Vincent in his letter says, I can't stand to get famous or wealthy uh, with, with these exemplars of love for my fellow man. And he actually said, if I sell these works, I feel like I'm raping the people I love most. And he tells uh, Theo to take them down. Well, Theo doesn't take them down, and a major art critic comes along and does a really good critique on it. it says Vincent is is the best artist in Paris right now, and actually Claude Monet himself states that Van Gogh is the best young artist up and coming. And with that information, Theo sends it to Vincent, and thinking that Vincent is going to be inspired to do great work and to be excited the fact that we'll have some money and we'll be able to do the things we want to do. And But when Vincent gets it, it makes him very depressed. It really distresses him. And then he goes out to this field right here and takes a gun and shoots himself in the chest. It does not kill him right away. He goes back home. Uh, Theo uh, comes to uh, the south of France and is by his bedside and Theo is there when Vincent dies of his gunshot wound. Now, Theo is uh, distraught by what he's done. And about eight months later, Theo himself, they say, will literally die of a broken heart. Now, there is a another little uh, explanation of this, which is interesting. <clears throat> Some people feel that Dr. Gachet was trying to work with Vincent and trying to get him out of his slump, his depression. And Theo had some physical problems, some, uh, some physical ailments that he had, and stress made it worse for him. So what Dr. Gachet, when he's talking to Vincent, and they have an argument one time, and Dr. Gachet said, no, Vincent, you know, snap out of it, man. You're putting a lot of stress on your brother. And you're, and you're killing your brother by putting stress on him with the physical ailments that he has. Well, instead of snapping Vincent out of it with that, Vincent sees that. He is giving stress on his brother. And compiled with the information that was being sent back about the critiques of his work, and with those ideas and those things that Dr. Gachet had said, those things together accumulated to him actually deciding to take his own life and, and shooting himself. So what we have, we have Vincent Van Gogh. There's a lot of mystery about what he did, but there are some things that we really do know about him because of his letters, and we're thankful for those letters. And Vincent turns out to be one of those extraordinary painters who's an art genius and, he, and his disability that he has actually turns his genius into some things that ascend any art that's made almost anywhere in the world. He just is extraordinary. And uh, matter of fact, you know, throughout my life, I remember seeing when, when sunflowers came up for sale. I think the most expensive painting was $3 million, and this one sold for $10 million. And then when the irises came up to sell, this one broke that record at $53 million. And when Dr. Gachet came up for sale, it broke it at 90 some million. You know, a really interesting story about the Dr. Gachet is that this was purchased by a Japanese businessman for over $90 million. And when they asked him why he did it, he said, well, I just want to be buried with it. And people thought the guy was joking. And years later, some people contacted him to, to have this in a show. And the family said, well, I'm sorry, but our, our father passed away. And they go, okay, we're sorry, can we borrow the painting? And they said, no, I'm sorry, he said that he was going to be buried with it. <laughs> what? He was actually buried with it. And they continue to say that he was cremated. <laughs> Which is kind of a stunning thing uh, to think that you had a, a $90 million painting uh, that you destroy when you get cremated when you do that. Well, the reason behind that, possibly, is the fact that the taxes... The, the estate taxes on this to be given to his family would have been $30 million. So the family would have had to pay $30 million in taxes to keep this, fam this family portrait. So he decided to have it cremated with him. And just recently, this last year or so, uh, there was an article that I read 
that that said that maybe the family pulled it out and they kept it secretly and they didn't do it and it was just all a ploy to be able to pass it on without having to pay the thirty million dollars to the Japanese government. We don't know. I'm, I I need to do more research on that and find that out. And I really don't know right now. I will find out sometime soon. So we're going to. Uh, uh, continue uh, with some other things at Alexis. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul Gauguin and some other things later, but we're not going to do that today. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that kind of summarizes some of the things we talked about that uh, in class, and you'll be able to know and understand a little bit more about Vincent Van Gogh than you did before. Okay, thank you very much.